It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I am one of the people in the room who for, for whom this is my first visit to the Biggs Museum. So I'm really pleased to be here and I'm really excited. You've heard it already by what Charlie, Ryan and Reggie and their colleagues are doing here, uh, looking backward and forward as the museum marks its 25th anniversary and really thinking seriously about institutional relevance and access and these absences that many of us are becoming certainly a lot more sensitive and aware of. Um, that this is happening at a moment when museums, both large and small, are broadening their definition of American art for 21st century audiences <coughs> makes this gathering that much more auspicious. Now I've been asked to kick off today's convening by exploring with you all the multi-layered significance of this newer direction for museum professionals and visitors alike. It's unsurprising that this approach is being more widely uh, discussed and embraced in this challenging time of fractured identities and cultural values that are calling into question our understanding of what constitutes America and by extension American art. In the post-Charlottesville heated debates over contested histories and meanings of public monuments, particularly memorials to Confederate generals erected long after Appomattox and the failure of Reconstruction during the Jim Crow era as potent expressions of the lost cause ideology and systemic American racism, museums have been frequently mentioned as the appropriate repositories for these works. And at left is the Lee Monument on Richmond's Monument Avenue, and at right, the infamous statue that sparked the unrest in Charlottesville. Whether you're an advocate for removal, relocation, or contextual reinterpretation, the fate of these large sculptures, intended for outdoor public display, does not, in my view, lie with art museums. It's fair to say that American museums already have their fair share of appropriately scaled problematic works <laughs> uh, shaped by this country's original sins of genocide and enslavement, as well as related struggles regarding oppression and resistance, discord and protest, some even by famous artists. Among the things that strikes me about this frequent call to move these troubling monuments indoors, an enormous logistical as well as political challenge, is what it reveals about current public perception and how that impacts museums' complicated self-positioning during these turbulent times. Yes, museums are on one level inherently conservative institutions due to their focus on long-term preservation and interpretation of the cultural past and present, but at the same time, 21st century museums, be it of art, history, or science, are so much more than that having strategically expanded their missions to welcome, entertain, and educate broader audiences. In the process, creating a new kind of public square. And it will come as little surprise to this audience that a wide range of people have tremendous interest in what we have and what we do, and have found a sense of shared belonging in our midst, even while periodically questioning who gets to speak for disquieting works and decide what museums should and should not exhibit. In his piece weighing in on the public monument debate, uh, New York Times art critic Holland Cotter echoed the call for moving the most offensive examples uh, to museums, arguing, for this to happen though, museums will have to relinquish their pretense of ideological neutrality. They will have to become truth-telling institutions. Cotter continued, our encyclopedic museums, like the Met, are giant warehouses filled with global objects, designed to function exactly the way the Confederate images do, as instruments of ideological persuasion with ethical messages we find well, we may, we, excuse me, we might well find repellent if we could read their visual symbols. And we need to learn to be symbol readers with our eyes wide open in our own political moment. He concluded, museums can be training grounds for that reading, though to be truly useful schools, they must be willing to identify themselves as historical halls of shame, as well as halls of fame. So this argument is one that Cotter, in my opinion, one of the most thoughtful and open-minded art critics working today, has posited before, and I'm thinking of his much discussed Making Museums Moral Again, uh, a piece that was published in the Times in March of 2016. In that piece, he highlighted the Met's departments of ancient art, Egyptian and classical, calling out curators for not rethinking their permanent collection narratives with the goal of, quote, exploratory truth-telling, while justly praising 
the museum's Congo Power and Majesty temporary exhibition for not shying away from uncomfortable histories of colonial exploitation and enslavement in polemical wall texts. Had Cotter expanded his framework at the Met and beyond, he would have found ample evidence in multiple American art collections of how curators are probing, in his words, art as evidence of history and pursuing a reckoning with history through art that has become more urgent in our nearly apocalyptic moment. And here is the famous artist, Fred Wilson of Mining the Museum fame, speaking about the Congo show with a class of students at the Met. Many history museums have long embraced this activist social justice role through their stated missions. For example, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Af African American History and Culture released a powerful statement in the aftermath of Charlottesville, affirming their commitment to, quote, bringing history with all of its pain and its promise front and center, continuing, only when we illuminate the dark corners and tell the unvarnished truth can we learn history's lessons and bridge the gaps that divide us. When it comes to art museums, though, certain commentators and supporters feel that such agendas do not fit as comfortably in the realm of creative expression. Famously, the New York Times critic Roberta Smith, writing in 2000, expressed concern that, quote, the mysterious creative work of curators was at that time in danger of being reduced to, quote, the level of the art historian or the social historian. <laughs> A curious statement on so many different levels, but... Um, <laughs> Smith continued to argue this position in 2013 when she advocated for breaking down walls between academic and so-called folk artists in American museums, an argument grounded in both aesthetic and sociopolitical terms, not to mention value judgments. Stating that the 2012 reinstallation of the Met's American Wing opted to, quote, tell American history through gallery displays rather than show its best paintings to their best advantage, Smith revealed her bias against more contextual approaches to curating. And suffice it to say, and shout out to our senior curator, Betsy Kornhauser, who has been hanging the Thomas Chambers so-called folk painting um, at right alongside Thomas Cole's iconic oxbow for some time now. Past controversy, controversies over so-called art historical revisionism, such as those that engulfed the Smithsonian American Art Museum during its 1991 West is America exhibition, are relevant in this context. And so is the Met's much reviled 1969 Harlem on my mind in terms of the issue of inclusive artistic agency. And the long-term reverberations of both efforts continue to be debated. I think there are now four books that have just, the last one has just come out on Harlem in my mind just last year. There's no question these cultural battles still haunt and inform curatorial practice at institutions, as institutions are increasingly called on to choose a path of broad or focused, inclusive or exclusive approaches that not even the most hidebound museums can ignore. Some, then and now, would question whether art museums should be more than sanctuaries for quiet meditation and reflection. But it's important to recall that the first encyclopedic art museums in this country were established with broader agendas of cultural reform rather than goals of aesthetic contemplation and connoisseurship. For example, the Met uh, was incorporated in 18, 1870 and opened its first home on 14th Street, Union Square, in 1872. Boston and Philadelphia followed soon after. All were outgrowths of the popular phenomenon of world's fairs and modeled after London's South Kensington Museum and its example of collecting international artworks and plaster casts of famous sculptures as tools of practical education and design. The MFA's early motto was actually art, education, and industry. The Met's founding mission emphasized the relationship between a museum and a library for art for, quote, encouraging and developing the study of the fine arts and the application of the arts to manufacture and practical life, of advancing the general knowledge of kindred subjects, and to that end, of furnishing popular instruction. While these institutional holdings were soon supplanted by more traditional fine arts, largely donated by wealthy collectors who prioritized the concept of the masterpiece, what can be interpreted in the, in the original mission statement as something akin to a public library of visual culture is echoed today by the Met's president and CEO, Daniel Weiss, who calls the museum a, quote, cultural university that produces knowledge through exhibitions, conservation work, research, and scholarship, 
and represents a commitment to human achievement and cultural empathy. Given my current perch in New York, I'd like to discuss the Met, specifically the American Wing, as a case study of how museums are increasingly questioning their curatorial privilege and practice in an effort to be more responsive, relevant, and, ac and accessible cultural caretakers in our pluralistic society, dealing with those absences specifically that Reggie and Ryan were talking about. While the Met is by no means alone in this effort, the weight of our history, scale, and resources inevitably brings greater public scrutiny and expectation. The Met has always been sensitive to the importance of founding legacies that have shaped the institution over its 148-year history. And I'm showing you our first building in Central Park, the 1880 Ruskinian Gothic design by Calbert Vox and Jacob Rye Mould that Edith Wharton referred to in her New York novel, The Age of Innocence, as moldered in unvisited loneliness. <laughs> I love that phrase. I just love that phrase. Uh, founding Met trustee and architect Richard Morris Hunt's 1902 Beaux-Arts building with its grand entrance on Fifth Avenue ushered in a new era of critical reputation and visitor popularity that continues to define the Met today, 7.3 million visitors annually and counting. Indeed, the Met today is not your parents' or grandparents' museum, having become more experimental, interdisciplinary, and cross-cultural in its focus. While still invested in producing grand historical narratives as spectacle, uh, one critic has called us a history writing and editing machine, but if you've seen the Dillacroix exhibition, for example, uh, the museum is less a dusty repository for works of art of the past than a place of so-called living culture, where, where aesthetic experiences can be found not only in our extensive galleries, but in our performance spaces and on our website, and just a reference to our app and some of our uh, teen programs. For example, we're privileged to host an annual artisan residence series, which has greatly benefited the American Wing in particular. Last year, uh, Nate DeMeo, known for his popular podcast, The Memory Palace, which I'd highly recommend to all of you, uh, introduced a fresh perspective on the Wing's collection by crafting eight evocative stories inspired by a range of objects. These oral experiences, which expand the amount of information and interpretation beyond what a curator can provide in a 100-word label, are available to visitors both in our galleries via highlighted signage as well as on our website. From a meditation on an early 19th century glass bottle to John Vanderlyn's Versailles panorama to the complex identity of mixed race sculptor uh, Ed Edmonia Lewis, all of these personal narratives express the knowledge that in DeMeo's words, a work of art can contain so much more than what is there in front of you. The issues and themes explored in these commission programs, shifting definitions of American art and culture, diversity and representation, and rich narrative content, resonate with the Wing's departmental goals, which align with the Met's uh, institutional strategic plans. Speaking of strategic plans, um, ours was adopted roughly three years ago. It was initiated by our former director, Tom Campbell, and is being continued by our current leadership. Uh, this is the Met's multi-year strategy that prioritizes, to a greater degree than ever before, the visitor experience and public access, while not devaluing the importance of the Met's collection and scholarship and programming that reflect the fundamental shared belief in the power of art and ideas to engage broader audiences. Now, I've had the privilege of heading the American Wing for just over four years now, coming to the Met, as you heard, from a senior leadership position at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, a state museum in Richmond, and before that, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia before that. As a specialist in late 19th and early 20th century American art and culture, I've long focused attention on lesser known men and women artists, as well as artists of color, in an effort to reconsider the so-called art historical canon by developing American collections and exhibitions that highlight a wider range of figures and works, both transformative and textural. And throughout my academic and curatorial uh, training, the American Wings collection has been an important touchstone. It was a genuine honor to succeed the esteemed curator of colonial, scholar of colonial furniture, Morrison Heckscher, at such a critical juncture in the Met's history. Maury and his crew, including senior management and trustees, are pictured in this playful image, marking the conservation and reframing of the iconic Emanuel Leutze painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, 
as well as the 2012 completion of the American Wing's highly successful renovation and reinstallation. That ambitious effort emphasized to a greater degree an intellectual framework of American history through a series of new painting and sculpture galleries, including <coughs> folk art, Civil War, and the West, for example, as well as decorative art installations organized by media and interactive interpretive screens for our storied uh, collection of period rooms. Fast forward six years, and the department's curatorial staff now consists of five specialists in decorative arts and five, myself included, in painting, sculpture, and works on paper, as well as two talented research associates and a rotating number of fellows and interns, a staffing that represents a return to a balanced complement of expertise. And I should note that Emily Casey, from whom we'll hear next, uh, was one of those very talented fellows uh, in our department just about a year and a half ago who added so much to the wing during her time there, finished her dissertation, and got a job within a couple of months. She's our banner or poster child for uh, fellows of the wing. Today, the wing's holdings of some 20,000 objects represent colonial to early modern, that is mid 17th to early 20th century, American and Latin American paintings, sculpture, drawings, and decorative arts, including furniture, textiles, ceramics, glass, silver, metalwork, jewelry, as well as historic interiors or period rooms and architectural fragments uh, produced by both highly trained and self-taught artists, both known and unidentified, adding up in effect to a museum of an expansively defined American art housed within an encyclopedic global museum. A large number of those works are on regular view throughout our 75 galleries, um, while more than 7,000 are displayed in our loose Center for the Study of American Art, an open storage space that the Met inaugurated in 1988. It was the first of the loose open storage projects one that the contemporary Brazilian New York-based artist Vic Muniz has called a semantic maze, transgressive and empowering. I love thinking about it that way. Um, much of the work in the American Wings collection is iconic in nature with numerous textbook examples of painting, sculpture, and decorative art. Yet, since arriving at the Met, I've been keen to interrogate our claim of having the most comprehensive collection of American art in the world, as, of course, one generation's canon is another's biased survey. And what does it really mean to say you have the most comprehensive collection of American art in the world? As some of you may know, the American Wing was established in 1924 in the midst of a popular colonial revival zeitgeist sweeping the country that valued both ancestor worship and the Americanization of newly arrived immigrants. As a result, the major collecting focus of, that, of the department was initially on British American colonial and federal decorative arts and Americana, a test run for which was explored in the very popular Hudson Fulton loan exhibition of 1909, the Met's first foray in showcasing chronologically installed American art in its then special exhibition galleries, and you see an image of it at left. This landmark loan show was part of New York's commemoration of the 300th anniversary of Henry Hudson's exploration of the river that bears his name. Robert DeForest, who served as the chair of the Celebrations Art Committee, later noted that the Hudson Fulton exhibition was not only intended to mark an important historical event, but to quote, test out the question whether American domestic art was worthy of a place in an art museum. The popularity of the exhibition, seen by nearly 300,000 visitors in under three months, uh, proved that it was indeed worthy, and the Met soon committed itself to building a collection of colonial and federal decorative art. And I should, that, should add that efforts like the Hudson Fulton exhibition ignored the production of New Spain, New France, and New Netherland for British American work, a, a focus very typical of the field at the time. And the image at right in the lower right is our first floor neoclassical parlor, which I think, as you see, evokes the mix of artistic forms that characterize the Hilton Fulton extravaganza. While traditional philosophies and approaches to the American past, as well as ideas of Americanness and cultural nationalism, determine the character of the wing from its 1924 founding through the World War II years, it was soon moving forward. Writing on the occasion of the Wing's 25th anniversary, in fact, in 1949, the magazine Antiques described it as, quote, a pioneering effort that led the way in furthering knowledge and appreciation of our American heritage. It is no exaggeration to say that its influence has been felt directly or indirectly by all the museums and historical societies working in the American field, 
all the restorations, public and private, all the publications on antiques, and all the collectors of American things. The editorial went on to call for an expanded educational mission in the wing and a focus on the 19th and 20th centuries, surprisingly, as the wing looked to its future, given the, quote, profound, enthusiastic, and inquiring interest that exists all over the country in the symbols of our own background. And I have to wonder, of course, if Mr. Sewell Biggs, uh, who I gather bought an apartment in New York in the late 1960s, um, certainly haunted the American wing and seeking inspiration for his own collecting project, I would guess. In fact, the 1960s was also an important decade for the wing, during which time planning began for the first major renovation of its gallery since the 1924 founding. Missing the opportunity to coordinate the reopening of the much expanded wing with America's bicentennial year due to New York's financial crisis in 1975, just such a New York story, it would be another five years before the project was completed, in fact. So in 1980, the new galleries and courtyard were enclosed in this dramatic skylit design by Kevin Roche, John Dinklu, and Associates, one that continues to be among the most popular public spaces at the Met. This transformative development extended the American Wing's character and scope, and the latest multi-year renovation and reinstallation, which again was completed in 2012, provided even greater flexibility for telling varied stories with a range of objects. Since that time, our collections have continued to evolve. The American Wing is one of the largest of the Met's 17 curatorial departments and the only Western collecting area at our institution to regularly blend painting, sculpture, drawings, and decorative arts throughout our 75 galleries. The impressive breadth and depth of the holdings uh, gives us a unique opportunity, I feel, to tell more expansive stories of American art, life, and identity, both through our mature holdings, as well as new acquisitions that broaden the collection and gallery narratives for our many visitors. To this end, we've been more intentionally addressing notable weaknesses in our collection, the absences, by acquiring significant work by underrepresented artists. For example, this early 19th century portrait by Joshua Johnson, America's first professional black painter to earn a living from his art. The son of a white man and an unidentified enslaved mother, Johnson apprenticed to a blacksmith before achieving his freedom in 1782, becoming part of Baltimore's large, free African-American population. Apparently self-taught, Johnson practiced his art in the city's competitive art world from around 1796 to 1824, living in the Fells Point area, populated by Quakers, abolitionists, and African Americans. While many of his commissions came from the city's prominent white merchant families, he also painted a more middle-class clientele composed of sea captains, shopkeepers, artisans, and other neighbors, but only two works by black sitters are attributed to him, two men. Johnson produced the bulk of his work between 1803 and 1815, uh, with more than half of his of uh, featuring white children. Emma von Nam is arguably his most ambitious and engaging portrait of an individual child. While it features numerous characteristics found in other Johnsons, it is distinguished by an almost bravura demonstration of the artist's talents in its nuanced palette, compositional complexity, and deft handling of details, particularly in the child's dress and demeanor. A sophisticated, savvy artist, Johnson was well aware of the taste of Baltimore's merchant class for portraits by the Peel family, though not uh, enslaved or trained by them, as some scholars had previously believed. Um, especially the example of uh, Charles Peel Polk is often uh, suggested as someone who had a particular influence, but clearly he had his own uh, distinctive aesthetic identity as well. Soon after I arrived at the Met, I worked with our curator of silver, Beth Weiss, and our curator of textiles, Amelia Peck, on this complimentary display of Boston silver, which, as many of you know, uh, silver was far more valued than paintings in 18th century British American society, and this extremely rare portrait by the first documented enslaved painter working in the colonies, Prince Demma, owned by the Henry Barnes family. Amelia had acquired the portrait of William Duguid, a Scottish-born, Boston-based merchant, a few years earlier due to her interest in the sitter's chintz dressing gown, this banyan that he's wearing, and she included the painting in her groundbreaking 2013 exhibition, Interwoven Globe, which explored the international market for textiles, for 18th century textiles. But the portrait had yet to be displayed in the American wing. It was hanging in the loose center, um, in, the, in our main galleries, but it was hanging in the loose center. 
After it went on view in our Colonial Painting Gallery, uh, Amelia co-authored an article for the January 2015 issue of the magazine Antiques. If you're interested in this article, I would, uh, in this artist, I would highly direct you to that article. But on this fascinating, but all but unknown artist with a Massachusetts-based historian who was researching Prince Dema's work and first alerted Amelia to his identity. She had no idea who he was. She bought it for the dressing gown. Incredibly, yes, just wonderful, uh, auspicious acquisition. So to date, three portraits have been identified by Prince Dema, the only known works to survive by an enslaved artist working in colonial British America. And I should mention that Jennifer Van Horn, uh, one of your neighbors at the University of Delaware, recently gave a very thoughtful talk on the artist and this painting at the National Portrait Gallery, in which she discusses early American portraiture as a racialized enterprise, and particularly exploring the you know fascinating shifting power dynamic of what does it mean to have an enslaved individual studying and painting a white sitter for as long as 10 hours in one sitting. What does that suggest in terms of shifting dynamics? And the talk is available to you on YouTube. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, the acquisition of this pair of mid-19th century Hiawatha and Minnehaha marble busts by the multiracial sculptor, African-American and Native American Anishinaabe, Edmonia Lewis, has allowed us to explore counter-narratives about artistic identity, practice, and interpretation in relation to other romanticized depictions of Native subjects by mostly male Euro-American artists in the Met's collection. Our Civil War and Reconstruction Gallery features more representations of African-American subjects by noted artists such as John Quincy Adams Ward, Winslow Homer, and Thomas Anschutz, more than any other space in the wing, but until recently was missing a work by an African-American artist. Now we have this striking circa 1890 oil by Charles Ethan Porter, the only 19th century black painter in America to specialize in still lifes, and one of the first to exhibit his art nationally. Porter studied in New York and Paris and painted this work at a time when the watermelon, an earlier symbol of American abundance, I believe you actually have a peel still life for watermelon in the collection, uh, but during the Civil War period, uh, one particularly associated with free blacks who grew and sold the fruit as a symbol of their emancipation and self-sufficiency at a time when it was increasingly being recast in popular terms as a virulent stereotype. By reclaiming this American subject in artistic terms and with a French stylistic flavor as well, Porter challenged a contemporary racist trope. And decades of, after decades of success painting still lifes of fruit and flowers with the support of patrons such as Samuel Clemens and Frederick Edwin Church, Porter died in poverty and obscurity. But a resurgence of interest in his work dates to the late 1980s coming out of a small show in uh, Connecticut. Pursuing this interest in work by artists of color in decorative arts has been more challenging due to fewer available works by known black artists, so we were understandably thrilled when one of our friends of the American wing agreed to lend us their magnificent mid-19th century stoneware jar by the enslaved literate potter David Drake of Edgefield, South Carolina. Currently on view in our Civil War and Reconstruction Gallery, which in some way has become a space that encapsulates our current approaches to display and interpretation in the wing, complicating history with a range of work by a diversity of artists addressing both the period itself as well as its relevant legacies. This Drake pot will be the centerpiece of a 2020 special exhibition on Edgefield stoneware being organized by my colleague Adrian Spinozzi, position here for scale in that sense. Um, Positioning the Drake pot here, as you see in the image, uh, between these two very different representations of the radical abolitionist John Brown, one by the 19th century Philadelphia painter Thomas Hovenden, and the other the mid-20th mid century Kansas regionalist John Stuart Curry, which is actually on loan to us from the Met's modern and contemporary department, um, opens up the conversation about race and representation in that gallery, in addition, of course, to aesthetic issues of style and artistic practice. The historical and modern dialogue between the Hovenden and the Curry, works which generally reside, as I noted, in two different departments at the Met, also suggests how we're rethinking the collections that we've inherited. 
Famously, the Met's controversial director, Thomas Hoving, determined the Met's curatorial taxonomy in 1967, the year that the Contemporary Arts Department was established, actually formed out of the American wing, with work by American artists born by 1876, presumably the centennial year, um, which is why they chose it, I guess, residing in the American wing after 1876 in the modern contemporary, galleries that are now separated by five long city blocks at very different opposite ends, obviously, of the Met's Fifth Avenue building. So for many reasons, this is not an ideal division. Yet despite this problematic inheritance, we are finding ways to explore conversations between artists both living and dead. For example, last year, we organized the very popular Sarah Berman's Closet, an innovative collaboration between our curator of period rooms and textiles, Amelia Peck, and the mother-son artists, Myra and Alex Kalman. This partnership represented the first time the wing's historical interiors had been interpreted through a contemporary lens. By putting the late 19th century aesthetic movement Worsham Rockefeller dressing room, our most recently installed historical interior, which is basically a glorified closet, uh, by putting it in dialogue with a late 19th century, less elaborate closet, a deeply meaningful interior of Sarah Berman, the mother and grandmother to Myra and Alex Kalman, we were able to explore issues of women's history and identity, taste and self-fashioning, not to mention immigration and mobility. And I should mention that Sarah Berman's closet will be installed uh, in Philadelphia kind of starting this summer on the, um, the mall right opposite the Liberty Bell at the, at the Jewish Museum. It's gonna be a very exciting, very different presentation of this work. So uh, put that on your radar. So in these terms, we're really moving beyond the exceptionalist question of what is American about American art, a discourse which defined the academic field from roughly the 1930s to the 1980s, even later in most museums. And we're also now asking when is American art, probing outmoded chronological divides between historical and modern contemporary works. In addition, we're considering where is American art, embracing a more hemispheric definition of American by introducing a gallery of colonial Mexican art, a landmark initiative of our Latin American specialist, Rhonda Castle. In her inaugural installation on collecting the arts of colonial Mexico, which opened roughly three years ago and has continued to evolve, Rhonda tells the fascinating story of our founders of the American wing, Emily and Robert DeForest's intentions uh, in a single gallery. As it happens, Robert DeForest envisioned a permanent gallery of Mexican art at the Met, and Emily DeForest, in 1911, offered to donate the museum part of her collection of Mexican ceramics, specifically Talavera de Puebla, with that purpose in mind. Here's an example of one of the most important pieces of her pottery collection, as well as an excerpt from a letter she wrote to the Met's director about her proposed gift. While the DeForest's persistent advocacy at the Met uh, led to a landmark traveling exhibition of Mexican arts in 1930, curated by René Darnacor, father of former Philadelphia Museum director Anne Darnacor, organized and circulated by the American Federation of Arts and funded by the Carnegie Corporation, their dream of interweaving Mexican arts and artifacts into a narrative of more traditional American art remained elusive at their home institution due to a lack of interest on the part of future administrators and curators. So we are very pleased eight decades later to finally be in a position to honor uh, some of our founders' intentions. Moreover, uh, these collectors um, also were very interested in Native American art, had a large collection of California baskets. So I'd like to think that DeForest are pleased to see how in the fall of 2016, we began to experiment with featuring Native American art in conversation with Euro-American production, for which the wing is best known, of course, through a few strategic loans from the collection of Charles and Valerie Diker, loans that soon became gifts and richly resonate with key American paintings and sculpture. For example, Jules Tavernier's dramatic scene of a Pomo Indian roundhouse ceremony, our first major work by a California-based artist, also acquired in 2016, which featured alongside a handsome late 19th century example of the Pomo's acclaimed artistry in basket making, one of the oldest forms of indigenous art. In our Art of the American West Gallery, we displayed a striking piece of black-on-black -black pottery by, by Maria and Julian Martinez, the famous Tewa Indian married couple. 
the Martinez's of the San Ildefonso Pueblo in New Mexico are among the most widely recognized 20th century potters in America, full stop. And the Martinez installation allowed us to expand the visual narrative of regional artistic production and reception beyond such well-known Euro-American figures as Frederick Remington and painters of the Tau School, whose work is also represented in this gallery. Then just a few weeks ago, as a replacement for the Martinez jar, which moved to another display, uh, we installed this work from 1990 by Nathan Begay, a Hopi Navajo artist whose cultural heritage shaped his traditional approach to contemporary subject matter and his uh, gay identity. It was very um, focused on kind of these autobiographical pieces. Back in early 2017, we featured in that gallery another loan from the Diker Collection, this remarkable pictorial muslin from the mid-1920s, about the size of this wall, uh, depicting the Battle of the Little Bighorn by Standing Bear, a respected Lakota artist and leader of the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Standing Bear fought in the infamous 1876 conflict as a 15-year-old. He also later traveled with Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West Show in Europe, famous for its climactic performance of that battle, which must have been an oddly surreal experience for him. This meaningful memory picture, which the Dikers donated to the Met last year, introduced an entirely new dimension to the more expected representations of Native and non-Native figures that largely fill that gallery. These purposeful juxtapositions represented the first time that the creative talents of indigenous Americans had been experienced in the galleries of the American wing, thereby enriching and complicating traditional narratives and installation frameworks. And they set the stage for the inaugural display in the wing of the promised gift of 91 objects from the Charles and Valerie Diker collection, in addition to more than 25 other gifts and loans from the pioneering collectors. Art of Native America, which opened at the beginning of October, is the third time that selections of the Diker Holdings have been seen at the Met. And I'm showing you images here of uh, the first installation, uh, Native Paths, which appeared in three different rotations between 1998 and 2000. And here are two views of the, dr the dramatic 2016 installation of their works that the American Wings visual dialogues I just shared with you uh, were meant to complement. So in both of these prior instances, the Diker Collection appeared in or near the Michael Rockefeller Galleries, or AAOA, the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, the department where Native American art has traditionally been shown at the Met, as in many encyclopedic museums. The American Wing installation similarly demonstrates the diversity and su superb aesthetic quality of the Diker Holdings while underlining their appropriateness in a department of historical American art. As the Met had, has never had a full-time curator of Native American art on staff, something we're committed to rectifying in the near future, the objects for the wings display were selected by a guest curator, Gaylord Torrance, the Fred and Virginia Merrill Senior Curator of American Indian Art at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, who has worked closely with the Dikers over the years. And here he is pictured with Met staff installing an extraordinary Plains Indian shirt. So the objects include painting, sculpture, drawing, regalia, ceramics, and basket by both identified and unrecorded makers, representing the extensive artistic achievements of culturally distinct, more than 50 culturally distinct indigenous peoples throughout North America and across time, from the second to the early 20th century. They also reveal a broad range of artistic practice from various regions of the United States and Canada, a first for the American wing to be showing work from Canada. Um, the woodlands, uh, Western Plains and Plateau, California and Great Basin, Southwest, Northwest Coast, and the Arctic, so seven different cultural regions. Represented nations include Acoma, Apache, Cheyenne, Creek, Crow, Delaware, Lenape, um, Hopi Teowa, Kiowa, Lakota, Pomo, Seneca, Seminole, Tlingit, and Zuni, among others. An extraordinary range of objects. Some of the greatest strengths in the Diker collection are sculptural objects from British Columbia and Alaska, California baskets, pottery from the southwestern pueblos, plains drawings and regalia, and rare accessories from the eastern woodlands. This first ever inclusion of Native American art in the Met's American wing, primarily devoted, as you've heard me say, to Euro-American art, marks a turning point in the presentation and interpretation of North American cultural production in a U.S. museum on the scale of the Met. 
We're well aware of the myriad debates and deeply held positions surrounding the collecting and display of Native American art by encyclopedic art museums and are committed to thoughtfully and sensitively exploring the entangled histories of contact and colonization in different contexts from indigenous and Euro-American perspectives with the assistance of both Native and non-Native colleagues, specialists, and community leaders, a number of whom make up our Diker Advisory Committee. Art of Native America was intended to be a very different installation of the special material than those previously seen at the Met, both in its design, a minimalist display that privileges the artworks in a light and airy space, uh, no dramatic uh, you know, heart of darkness lighting uh, in this installation, <laughs> as well as in its conceptualization. Inspired by our advisory committee, from the start we focused on the importance of multiple voices and dialogues between the curators and Native experts in both presentation and interpretation, something that actually begins right at the entrance to the display with these uh, quotes, uh, which we have projected on the wall. And I'll give you a little time to read them. I should mention all of this is actually on our website for the exhibition as well. We also felt it was important to add a credit panel, a rarity for the Met, actually identifying the curators, um, as well as a land acknowledgement, um, in addition to contributors, the native contributors, mostly historians, to the many interpretive texts that are scattered throughout the installation, texts that share perspectives of both past and present. Moreover, we believed it was important to include a map, also a first in the American wing, uh, but only in the interior of the installation, not something that you confront head on, um, given the large number of international visitors that we have at the museum, not to mention American visitors have, who have very little sense, of course, of our geography. The map also helps explain the overall organizing framework of the installation by regional and cultural areas, while emphasizing the fluidity and exchange among cultures then and now, and noting that, that of course, many Native peoples uh, live outside their ancestral homelands today. I personally felt it was important to open the display in with the Eastern Woodlands, a nod to our New York location, and we were interested to learn in the course of um, our project that New York City has the largest and most diverse population, population of indigenous Americans in the country uh, based on recent census records. This section has some of the most historically significant work in the installation, including this remarkable shoulder bag missing its strap made by an unknown Anishinaabe woman. The iconic piece was once owned by the Reverend Peter Jones, the first indigenous North American to be ordained as a Methodist minister, pictured at left in what is believed to be among the earliest photographs of a named Native American. The Met is lucky to have this print in our photography collection, and it's currently being featured actually in a complimentary installation that we just opened. It's entitled Artistic Encounters with Indigenous America um, that is in our Loose Center. Now, as I'm conscious of my time, um, I want to quickly just move through um, the other sections of the display to give you a taste of it, showing some key highlights here, Northwest Coast and Arctic, uh, featuring this extraordinary Tlingit mantle and Yupik mask, the extensive plain sections with its powerful uh, girl's robe made from a young deer hide, and here's an image of how it would have been worn by the um, mid-19th century Swiss-American artist Carl Bodmer, whose work will be seen in the wing in a special exhibition in 2021. One of a group of haunting ledger drawings and this vivid shield by the um, known artist Joseph No Two Horns. Textiles and pottery from the Southwest, including this compelling water jar by the matriarch of Hopi Teowa polychrome work, Nampeo and an impressive array of baskets from California in the Great Basin, also produced largely by identified women, including Carrie Bethel and Elizabeth Hickox. And then here is the vestibule entrance to the installation from the Temple of Dender side of the wing with this photo ex evocatively capturing the ghostly marble presence of George Washington. <laughs> Layers of interesting ideas there, uh, flanked by a longer welcome and land acknowledgement from our colleagues at New York's Lenape Center, the first time that such a statement has appeared on the walls of the Met. We also felt it was important to, in, um, to feature a native work in dialogue with some of the better known Euro-American collections on the main floor of the wing, here from the federal period, 
and this exquisite Nescafe hunting coat, um, likely from Labrador or Quebec, and informed, as you see, by French colonial dress, was the ideal example of such cultural exchange and hybridity. These important relationships also determine the shape and program of our opening. Here are the dikers themselves at right with their friends, the Haida artists, Terry Lynn Williams Davidson and Robert Davidson, who offered a compelling invocation at the event. We were also lucky to involve Ty, De Ty Defoe, uh, the New York-based interdisciplinary artist of Ojibwa and Oneida descent, here communing with Augusta St. Gaudens's Hiawatha sculpture. Ty also offered a hoop dance at the press preview and opening and contributed to our Native Perspectives Responsive Label Project, which focuses on some of the better known representations of Native subjects by Euro-American artists in the collection. Um, they're identified by these purple labels scattered throughout the wing. Our colleagues in education organized an amazing public opening event in partnership with the Canadian Consulate, highlighting First Nations artists like DJ Shubb with the hip-hop inflected uh, hoop dancer James Jones. I think they're often in Philadelphia. They love Philadelphia. Uh, then in, on Indigenous Peoples Day, the Met's Popular Artists on Art series featured these contemporary Native performing and visual artists, Martha Redbone, um, who was part Native American, part African American, Jackson Paulus, uh, Tlingit artist, and again, Ty Defoe speaking about works in the Diker installation. And I'm emphasizing these public programs as it's been particularly important to us to partner with a range of contemporary artists on this project to underline the significance of these living cultures of Native Americans, as there is only historical work represented in the Diker collection. The latest work dates to the 1930s. I wanted to conclu conclude by emphasizing that while this, this early, this inaugural iteration of the Diker installation will be on view for one full year, the Met has made a 10-year commitment to featuring Native American art in the Wings Wolf Gallery, our special exhibition space. So this really is just the beginning of our new venture. Uh, future responsive displays of both Native and Euro-American art in the part of that gallery in the L-shaped end, the Dender end, which will replace light-sensitive works in the Diker collection, will further explore these relevant cross-cultural dialogues. For example, these might include a close look at George Caleb Bingham's Fur Traders Descending the Missouri, one of our icons, in terms of hybrid identities and kinship ties, or a Lewis Comfort Tiffany's native-inspired basket chandelier commissioned by the founders of the American Wing, Emily and Robert DeForest, whose collecting tastes, as I mentioned earlier, range from Native and Latin American to more traditional British American decorative arts. And I'm thrilled to say that a number of curators in the wing have really risen to the challenge and have already stepped forward with, with thoughtful ideas for that space. Building on the DeForest's innovative collecting practice and philosophy, this expansive understanding of American art will also enrich the Met's canonic holdings through new perspectives and contexts that reckon with this country's complex history in a variety of ways, from display to interpretation. For example, I wonder how many of our visitors have noticed the figure at the far right of Leutze's iconic canvas bedecked in indigenous woodlands clothing, including what appears to be an Anishinaabe shoulder bag, suggestive of one in the Dyker's collection. Such a detail in the Leutze opens up this very well-known, well-studied painting in fresh ways, creating dialogue between native and non-native worlds. For many museum professionals and audiences, Holland Cotter's 2015 clarion call for greater progressive action and curatorial responsibility deeply resonated. And more today appear to believe there needs to be an ongoing commitment to sharing a broader range of local, national, and international stories through ever evolving, expansively defined collections of American art. At the Met, bringing together works by historical African-American, Euro-American, Latin American, and Native American artists, we're working on Asian American, um, in different aesthetic and interpretive contexts, will allow us to move closer to presenting an American wing that looks and speaks more like America. Thank you.